Hello and welcome to another episode of Bare Bones Wargaming, a show with no bells, no whistles, no frills, just a man, a camera, and his game. Now, I know it's been a while since I've seen y'all, um, but it's been quite busy here at Bare Bones Wargaming Central. Uh, busy family-wise and also busy game-wise. Um, I know I mentioned other games. I'm sure some of you are looking at the picture here in front of you right now and being like, wait a minute, that don't look like that don't look like a World War I map or, or a Great Pacific War map. Well, you would be correct. Um, kind of, to be honest, part of the reason it's taken me a while to kind of come back with a video is I've kind of burned myself out on World War II for right now in Modern Warfare, so basically World War I forward. Uh, so I've been busy digging through my collection and literally blowing the dust off some games um, from different topics. I have, you know, some Napoleonic and Civil War and stuff. Um, but I was looking at Here Come the Rebels just the other day, and I haven't played that since 2007. What? So, yeah, it's been a little tiny bit of time since i played some of these games. So I'm kind of pulling them out of the dust and kind of shifting gears because, you know, like I said, I'm kind of burnt out on World War II. So... That's kind of what's going on. So you can expect a few videos upcoming here uh, that are going to be non-World War II stuff. And then I'll shift gears um, back into uh, that time period once, of course, I get kind of burned on this. Um, so you can expect, I'm hoping, to do a Napoleonic 20 game, which is a very popular system. I enjoy it immensely. Do this game you see in front of you and um, also maybe a scenario from Here Come the Rebels. Um, the, in particular, I'm thinking about the Lost Order scenario with Little Mac. Uh, if you don't know much about that, I'll kind of explain that in a later video. What you see in front of you, probably a lot of you recognize, because a lot of people have this game and they enjoy this game, is a game that I had on my wish list for a while, and then a couple weeks ago, actually last week, not even a couple weeks, somebody approached me on BGG and was like, hey, I got a copy for trade, do you want to trade... War of the Worlds France, and I was like, oh, baby, yes, I do. Uh, uh, just some of the worst games I have played in recent memory. You can see that on one of my lists. I think it was for 2018. Uh, best and worst list there. So, with that preamble, so to speak, let's take a look here at the game for this episode, which is, again, as many of you probably already have guessed, is A House Divided. Um, this is the... Mayfair version of it, game by Frank Chadwick, which I did not realize that, that Chadwick had done this. Um, I do enjoy a lot of his designs. Uh, and this is the most recent one, I believe 2012, is this one here. Okay. So, this is a strategic American Civil War game, or as I like to call it, the Civil War, because of course I'm an American, it's my Civil War. And of course, as you can see, we've got a map of the entire country. And, of course, you can play whichever side you want. So you can either be the South. Oh, I wish I was in a land of cotton. Old time there, a long forgotten. Look away, look away, look away, Dixieland. Or you can, of course, be the North. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. Either way. Uh, you can play it. Now, this game, one thing I will say I do like about this game already, spoiler alert, I do like the game, um, is I like the fact that it has basic, advanced, and optional rules for both. So, when I do this playthrough here, I'm going to, basically, I will let you know which rules I'm using as I go through the turn. I'm not using all the rules, another spoiler alert. Uh, but I will mention some of the rules that I use because, and reasons for why I do or do not use them. Because um, again, I'm not a huge fan of the American Civil War anymore, so to speak. Um, back in the early, or in 2000, I spent about five years intensely studying um, the American Civil War. And then I kind of felt satiated. I kind of felt like, okay, I've learned a lot and I have enough that I like and I'm done. And I moved on to other things. Uh, but I had all the great campaigns of the American Civil War. Uh, I had some other other games too, like For the People is around here someplace, I think, still. So, I was very much into it, but now it's kind of like uh, I'm looking for a game that's a little bit lighter, but still gives a good feel. Um, and I think this one is going to become my go-to game for that. I'm replacing both the Lost Cause, which is one of those um, States of Siege game, and then also the Confederate Rebellion, which is around here someplace, too. Okay, so, basically... 
Obviously, if you're the North, you're trying to capture key areas of the South, just like what happened in the actual war. There's a whole list of them in the rule book. I won't go over all of them, but, you know, they're the typical usual suspects you would expect, like, you know, Richmond and New Orleans and places like that. Um, of course, the South, if you can get Washington, that's always a big plus. And then, of course, you're just trying to survive the war. You can also win the game by getting your army maximum size bigger than the North. And you do that by whacking out recruitment centers. Okay, each turn basically has four phases. You move, you fight, you promote, and then you recruit. That's it, okay? All right, so without further ado, let's get rolling here, okay? So right now, I am in June of 1862, okay? And the first thing we're gonna do is movement, okay? Now, the basic game, movement, you basically roll a die, and that's how many marches you get. Um, each unit, can march twice per turn, maximum, okay? And of course you have different routes that you can use for marching. And um, I'll zoom in down here just to show you real quick here at the bottom of the map. They've got a nice little chart, okay? So, you know, you got your infantry, you got your cavalry moving on the road, moving unfriendly railroad, friendly railroad, rivers, okay? And there are also special moves that you can do which we'll talk about as we go through this. Okay. Now what I'm doing is I'm using the advanced rule, which has a marches table basically that determines how many marches you get. Okay, And I think that's a little more realistic in my opinion because at the beginning of the war the Union was obviously not as assertive as the South was. It wasn't as dynamic maybe is a good way of putting it, especially in the East. So I think that's a good rule to have, so that's what I'm doing here. So I've rolled on the chart, and I already rolled a 5. And you can see here from the chart here, which, by the way, is one of the things I don't like about the game. Look how flimsy that is. You can hear it. That's not good. So I rolled a five. It's 1862, so I will get four marches for my Union forces. Okay? All right. Now, strategically right now, I have moved into Kentucky. I was playing the optional rule where Kentucky was neutral and the Union could not move in unless the Confederacy did in 1861. They couldn't go in until the beginning of 1862. So across the map here, you can see where my blue line is. And then over here, I've got a lot of build up. I had actually landed, which really happened, by the way, in the Civil War. I had actually landed in New Bern, North Carolina, and was pushing out. And then the Confederates, again, with their superior march numbers, were able to concentrate faster than I was, and they crushed my invasion force. And now they've turned north again to protect Richmond. Okay, so we're going to go ahead up here with my four marches. Okay, and I'm going to start up over here in the east. All right, now combat units have two sides to them. Combat units have a full strength side, which is white, and then they have a reduced side. Okay. Now you can see the combat values do not change in this game for that, all right? Now in the normal game, at the end of every battle, you flip the units back over to full strength and everything's hunky-dory. In the advanced or optional rule, I can't remember which, I'll be honest, I'm not sure if it's a standard advanced game or an optional, but anyway, I'm using it, you have to refit them, okay? And you can either refit them in one of two ways, either with a march during your march, your movement phase, or you can refit them with a recruitment point during your recruitment phase. Okay, so I've got four marches, and my goal right now, to again, to kind of show you a nice big um, battle here too, my goal here right now is to move into uh, Fredericksburg and try to get some pressure there. Dun, 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 dun. And of course, here's Richmond um, at this point, because I feel like I'm in pretty good shape over here as the Union. Okay, so for my first march, I'm actually going to flip this one unit here, so it will be full strength. And then for my second march, I'm going to move all these guys from Manassas Junction to Fredericksburg to get ready for the big battle. My third march, I'm going to move a bunch of units down to Manassas Junction from D.C. Okay. Now notice when you move, when you do a march, you activate a box, not the units in the box themselves. And there's no stacking limits in this game. Okay. So that's three marches so far. Refitting. Moving to Fredericksburg by the road, which you only have one movement. And then this railway down in here to Manassas Junction is my third march. So I have one march left, a fourth march. And what I think I'm going to do with that fourth march is I'm going to come out here to the Queen City of Ohio, Cincinnati. The Gauntleiter of Cincinnati. 
for those of you, for your Stalag 17 fans. And I want to move down here because eventually I plan on driving down here against this Confederate force that has entered southern Kentucky, picking up Bowling Green in a recruitment center, and moving against uh, Nashville, I believe is down there, y'all, as well. Okay? All right, so that's my movement phase. I am done. So now we're going to have combat, which is going to be a gigantic battle here at Fredericksburg. Okay? All right, so let's see how this Fredericksburg fight is going to work out. So now me, this is my battle marker. <laughs> I love this thing. It's the glow-in-the-dark um, die from one of the nuclear war expansions. I can't remember which one, but I always use it Okay, for that. All right. Now, before I outline here the battle, let me just show you something here about uh, something else about the spaces here for combat purposes. So let's go up here to Fredericksburg, which I've been to the Fredericksburg battlefield oh, probably three or four times at least, minimally. Okay. Now you can see each box has a connecting line to it. So if you move, like here's the river line from D.C., the Potomac River, here's the road line from Manassas Junction to Fredericksburg. But also, you can probably see here the blue edge, that's crossing the river there, Okay, which that's one of the combat modifiers. So you do want to be careful crossing that, um, those because that does put an unfavorable um, modifier on your attacking forces. Okay, There are modifiers that um, hinder sides depending on what's going on with both terrain and also uh, units. Units in this game come in three different sizes. They either come in militia, which you can see right there, the twos. They also come in veteran troops, which is the threes. And then there's also the crack troops. And I'll just put this one down here in Fredericksburg just to show you, which you can see is a strength of three, but also a minus one. So anybody who attacks that crack unit, think Iron Brigade here, um, is basically is going to be at a disadvantage. And we'll talk about that here in a second as we fight the Battle of Fredericksburg. Okay, so that's where our battle is. Now, there is a command table which basically allows only so many orders per round. Um, I don't like it because it's too much, it's more detail than I want. Let's put it that way. But for those of you who are looking for a nice strategic game here that has. Um, that has that kind of detail, then this would definitely be the thing for you. Okay. Now I've got one entrenched rebel unit here. These other rebel units did not get entrenched. They just arrived last turn. They did not have time to get entrenched. Notice there's also a rebel unit that is reduced here as well. So let me zoom in on that battle here a little bit more for y'all, so to speak. There we go. Let me slide it up. Just slide everybody up just a little bit to give a better vantage point. Okay. Now, basically, you fire in rounds, and every unit has to be fired at. Um, this is kind of like War at Sea. You cannot change your mind once you've lined it up. So if you double team on somebody, and one of your units hits it, well, too bad, so sad. You cannot change the firing of that ability, of the firing that that unit's going to do. Okay? So I'm going to pair up my guys here. Okay? And since we attacked across the river, all these guys are going to have a minus one to their attack value right off the bat. So that sucks. Okay? So, um, yeah, the whole river thing is, is a problem. And of course, again, if you've been to Fredericksburg, if you've ever been and seen where Burnside's, um, I'm sorry, no, Burnside's bridge is actually in Tetum, but where they built the pontoon bridge is when Burnside was in charge of the campaign that resulted in the Battle of Fredericksburg on December 13th, 1862, um, you can easily see that why it's, there is such a serious uh, modifier as far as the river goes, okay? So coming across that river is, is just, it's just plain old nasty. Um, yeah, it's just, um, yeah, it's just, yeah. So, oh, I'm sorry. Let me take that back. Actually, the river is, is the only one that's the opposite. You get a plus one um, to the attack value of the defenders when you cross the river. Okay, but only for the first two battle rounds. All right, that's it. Um, so, okay. So let's go here. All right, so the defender gets to fire first. So this militia now will actually be a three. So let's see how he does. He needs three or less. Boom! And combat is not simultaneous either. Okay? So we've got these guys. Now, they will actually get 
plus one, which would take them up to four, but they're shooting at a crack unit, so that actually will take them back down to three. So that will kind of cancel it out. Ah, I guess they really are damaged. Look at that, they rolled six. Same thing for the next one. Up, oh, but they did. Up, oh, they managed the four, so no hit for them either. Womp, womp, womp. And now this militia will actually be three or less. Or no, it will stay two or less, because wow, I didn't realize I had three crack units there for the Union Army. Okay, so Confederacy, not so good. They only got one hit. Now again, combat is not simultaneous. So these guys will get flipped. They will be reduced. Everybody else is just peachy, so to speak. Okay. Now the Union will get to open up. Now, of course, the entrenchment, as you can see right there, is a negative one. So that will have a negative one here. So that will take them down to two. Now, combat modifiers are cumulative. So it is conceivably possible that you could end up with a unit that cannot hit the enemy, that they can have a zero. But you can still line them up opposite a unit, and that still counts as firing at it. So keep that in mind as part of a strategy for the game. So let's see if the Union does any better. All right, let's see. Now, normally this would be a hit, but these guys are entrenched. So actually that takes it down to two or less. Womp womp. Now these guys did hit. Now this one's already reduced, so they are eliminated from the game. They go back into the pool for promotions, I should say. Um, recruitment is a little bit different. We'll talk about how you get veteran units here a little bit later. These guys, so much for them being crack troops. Look at that, they rolled six. What is that? And then these guys also managed to get a hit. Whoops. Ah. They fell off the table. They must have been running for it. Reminds me of that quote from the Battle of, um, I believe, Murfreesboro or Stones River, depending on which side you like to look at the war from, where the one cannon fire scared a bunch of rabbits out of the bush, and one of the rebel soldiers was like, go to it, Cottontail. I'd run too if I had a reputation. So, all right. So the Union was fairly successful. Now, after each round of combat, either side can retreat if they want from there. Now you have, of course have to be able to retreat. You have to have some place to go. Usually not a problem here, but um, it can be when you get cavalry involved and you get cavalry jumps or, or Union River jumps and stuff. Um, I'll try and demonstrate one of those here if I can in a little bit. Can't really do it here because these boxes are both right next to each other. Okay. Now after each side decides whether they want to retreat, then let me kind of pop back up here to Fredericksburg real quick. Okay. Then once they do that, then you can decide whether you want to reinforce the battle. Now you can reinforce with one unit each round from any space that is connected, which is why I brought these Union troops down here. Now, of course, the Confederacy could reinforce also from Richmond. So let's go ahead and let's do that, okay? Let's say we're going to stick around, all right? So I'll bring down this other veteran Union unit. And, oh, we got a veteran unit to commit from Richmond. All right, so we'll go ahead and we'll do that, okay? All right, so both sides are reinforced. You may only reinforce with one, okay? Now, with the again, with the advanced combat rules and stuff, it's a little, whoops, sorry about that. I'm trying to get a close-up there of Georgia, y'all. Um, so it's a little bit different, but let me just get her reorganized here. Hang on. La, 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 la. All right, there we go. So now we're ready for our next round of battle. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to, now I can double up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and double down on these guys here. Forget the guys in the trench. Okay, and of course they're going to go ahead and fire at my wounded one because that, that makes sense. Actually it makes more sense for them to kind of crossfire that way there. So we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll figure out who wants to fire at who here. Um, I think I like the rest of it, though, so we'll keep it that way. All right, here we go. So the Confederacy. All right, so now these guys will open fire against these crack troops, which will leave them at a two, but now we'll see what they can do. Actually, you know what? No, they'll open fire at these guys down here. So what I'll do for this time is to show the cross-pollination, so to speak. 
I'll put it on top of the unit that is targeted. Okay, these guys are going to try and destroy that vector unit so it doesn't have a chance to shoot. Good call. Okay. These guys will engage this crack unit here, which unfortunately means that, well, they're on the other side of the river. Well, but it will cancel out. So unfortunately, that means they're still only going to be two. Oh, no luck there. And then these guys will try and take that one out, and they'll stay at a three as well. Okay. All right. So now just the Union, of course, has one extra unit. Okay. So this guy took a hit. This guy also took a hit. This guy took a hit. And, of course, you missed with this one here. So not too bad. Okay, so that one Union unit is eliminated, which will then be adjusted there. All right, now the Union, again, we have to engage everybody. So I'll go ahead and have the crack troops attack up there. And let's see what kind of damage we can do here. All right. Okay. So we'll be minus one. I wouldn't see a mess. Missed. Okay, these guys here. There's a good hit. These guys here, next in row. Another good hit. And these last ones, let's see if I can get this hit. Oh, that is a miss. Okay, but we did manage to get two hits. One hit wipes out this militia, which actually goes back into the pool and is available to be recruited by the Confederacy here a little bit later. Whoops. And then these guys here will get flipped as well. Okay. Now again, each side has to decide whether they want to retreat or whether they want to go ahead and reinforce the battle. What I'm going to do just for the purposes of this video is I'm going to go ahead and drop the Confederates back because they have fewer people now. They have not as many units to reinforce with. So I'm going to go ahead and drop them back, which means, yes, I do lose the entrenchment modifier in bonus. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to have them fall back to actually, we'll have them fall back to Yorktown. Okay. And the reason I'm having them fall back to Yorktown is that then if I decide to attack, then I can try to commit them to the battle as needed. Okay. Now, the Union did take a bit of a beating, all right, but they won the battle. Now, at the conclusion of each battle, you can promote one of your units, Militia to Veteran and Veteran to Crack. Now, once they're at Crack level, they can't be promoted. And I'm using the optional rule where you can only promote units to Crack value. Sounds bad. Sounds bad. <laughs> Converted to a Crack unit. That still sounds bad. To an Elite unit. I have to use that word. I'm sorry to an elite unit only via battle. You cannot do it any other way, okay? So that's what I'll do here. I'll take this veteran unit, and, well, you kind of sound like the $6 million man. We can rebuild them. We can make them stronger, faster, okay? And I win the battle, all right? So the Battle of Fredericksburg, this time around, actually went the Union's way. So I guess this time we don't have Burnside while well, he's sending those guys across the bridge, 12,000 casualties, holy smokes, pacing back and forth going, oh, those poor men, those poor men, I'm thinking of them all the time. Yeah. You know, should come up with a better plan. Sorry, but it's true. All right. Now, combat's done. That was the only space where I had combat to do. Okay, so now we move on to the promotion phase. Now, in the promotion phase, you can promote any one unit on the board from its level to the next one up. Now, generally speaking, you want to do militia to veterans because that's how you get more units, okay, um, by getting more militia. You can only recruit militia. You cannot recruit veterans. You cannot recruit the elite units. So what I'm going to do here is to try and keep this momentum up in the east. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take this militia unit here at Manassas Junction and I will replace it with one of my veteran troops there. Okay, cool. All right, now it's time for recruitment. Now recruitment, you basically roll a die and that's how many recruitment points you get. Now, in the basic game, that's that, okay? But you always get two, all right? Um, same thing with marches in the, in the basic game. You will always get two. Even if you roll one, you'll always get two, okay? However, in the advanced game, The Union always gets 
a minimum of three because of the manpower that was available to it. And the Confederacy can never have more than four. Okay, so let's see what I roll here. Okay, so I've rolled a four for the Union, so I can go ahead and recruit four units. Okay, now, <coughs> allergies are already kicking in. I mean, you know, it's getting to be the middle of March, right? Now, each one of these cities that has a yellow number value in it is a recruitment city um, for the Union. So you can put your units in a recruitment city, okay? Um, and yeah, you're not seeing things here that Knoxville is yellow um, because Eastern Tennessee actually had a lot of loyal Unionists. Um, in the Union Army during the war, there actually was the first Alabama Cavalry, which came from the northern part of Alabama where there's some hills. Um, and those folks did not like the plantation folks, so... They stuck with the Union, so to speak. So I have four here, okay? So in your pool, you can go ahead and recruit up to the maximum whatever you have there. So I've got three, so the last one is just lost. Too bad, so sad for me, okay? So I'm going to put one in D.C., obviously. I'll put one in Baltimore. If you're from that area, you know what I'm talking about. And then I want to continue my activities out here in the West. So I'm going to put one here in Indianapolis, too, because I'm going to try and put pressure down here. I'm going to might do one more turn just to show you how that works over there. And that's it. That's the end. Now we're on to the Confederacy. So the Confederacy, same thing. We're going to roll on their march table. Let's see how many marches they get. They rolled a three for 1862. That gives them four marches all together. All right. Now, the question is, what do I want to do here? as the Confederacy? Uh, that's a good question. Because I've got these guys entrenched, because I'm just basically trying to block the enemy from coming down the mighty Mississippi. I probably should try to repair some damage here. I don't think I'm really ready to take the offensive. I mean, I could. Um, I could go against some of these wounded Union units over here and take some troops from Richmond and try and strike at them. But there are two full-strength crack units there, too. I don't know if that's the best idea in the world. Okay. Notice that last battle, too. Um, only the winner gets to promote. The loser does not. Okay. Um, let's try and take some pressure off the east by causing some trouble out west. So, what I'm going to do here is I've got four marches. So, now, railroad connections, if it's friendly, you can move two. So I'm going to take all these guys from Nashville and go one, two, up here to Mumfordville. Okay? So that's their first march. Okay? Then I'm going to take these guys into there. Also their first march. And, of course, the second march there. Now, since they were there before, and they were there at the end of their segment, as the rules say um, specifically, Bowling Green is now a Confederate-controlled space. Okay. Um, so that was two marches total, one by each. So now I'm going to take a third march, activating this box, and we're going to attack Louisville. And i got one more march to go, and I think what I'll do with my last march is I'm going to flip these guys over back to full. Well, I could entrench them, though, too, couldn't I? And try to protect... The, you know what? Let's do that. I will spend a march to entrench well hold on i gotta double check because i don't i haven't done a lot of entrenching i'm not i'm not really a, a big digger in kind of guy let me just make sure uh, okay so it's not a recruitment city so i have to activate twice anyway never mind forget it scratch that thought so you can entrench but it takes some work to entrench as you can see recruitment city you only need one march and it is by unit, so I'm just going to flip those guys with my fourth march. Okay, so we'll do another battle up here in Louisville. All right. And again, I'll mark with my trusty little skull there. Okay. And, of course, we'll go three on three, and then we'll go here with the defense, okay, for the first round. So we'll come down here again, and we'll zoom in for the battle. Okay. 
All right, now notice you can't retreat before the battle. You always have to fight at least one round, then you can retreat if you wish. All right, so let's see what I can do with the Union here, see if I can do any damage with these guys. Now, there's no modifiers going on. So I've got my Veteran Infantry. Oh, I rolled a six, great. My Militia, who rolled a two, well, that's good. So that damaged those guys, excellent. And then I got this Cavalry. Who missed also? Not so good. All right. So now the Confederacy obviously will do this here, but I'm going to double down on the Union veteran and try to take him out. See what happens. Okay, Confederate veteran missed. Confederate militia missed. Down to the next fight. Confederate militia got a hit. So both sides are damaged now in that portion of the battle line. I mean, if you think about. You know, what the Civil War battlefield looked like with the lines of men and all that stuff. And you, can kind of, you can kind of picture that. And then last but not least, we'll have these guys attack the cavalry. And they miss. Now, at this point, either side can retreat. Obviously, the Confederacy is not going to retreat because Louisville is a recruitment um, area. So they're going to they're gonna want that. They're going to they're gonna want those points. Yeah. To help increase the size of their army and strengthen them at all. Okay. Um, oh, I forgot to leave somebody there for supply. Ooh, now, the supply rules are pretty simple. Um, railroads are important. Road supply is tricky in this game. You have to keep a unit in the box if it's not an original um, territory. Uh, which is why I was kind of like, shoot, I forgot to leave somebody behind. So, I'll have to deal with that next turn. Basically, if you're out of supply, whatever box you're out of supply, if you have two or more units, you have to eliminate one at the beginning of your turn. So. All right. Not so good there. So, should the Union do another round of battle? Now, you know what? I think what we'll do is we'll retreat upriver. We'll disengage. We'll head upriver to um, Cincinnati. Now, again, the Confederates will be able to take one unit, so we'll take this militia unit here and promote it to veteran status. And Louisville is now under Confederate control, which will increase the size of their army, creeping them closer towards the Union. Because remember, that's one of the ways they can win, is by having a bigger maximum army size than the Union. Basically, the Confederacy has three ways to win. Capture DC, have a bigger maximum army size at any point in time, or basically just survive. The Union, of course, has to capture all those cities to achieve victory. Um, this is, I'm sure you're probably kind of curious about it. Here you go. Here's a list. Right here. Um, there they are. So Richmond, Charleston, makes sense. New Orleans, Mobile, Mobile, blah, 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 blah. Atlanta, Wilmington, and Memphis, y'all. Okay. All right. So, we're done with that. Now, Confederates also have an optional rule where they can promote more than one per turn depending on the die roll. For every veteran unit you lose in a, in a turn, you get to subtract one. If the result is one or less, you actually get to promote two. And they actually rolled a one, so we don't have to worry about that. So they'll be able to promote two. Now, this is good for the Confederacy, because now, not only will he get some more veteran troops, which is really good for them, but they will also now have two more militia they'll be able to recruit. So we'll put one of these veteran troops in Richmond. And I think I'm going to put the other one actually down here in Petersburg. So now the Confederacy actually has four units they can recruit this turn. Okay, very cool for them. And four is what they roll. That is their maximum they are allowed. So they actually do have four. So let's go with Richmond. Not a big surprise there. Uh, Nashville. And let's go Raleigh. Keep things moving there. And let's see. Now you can only put one in a space per turn unless it's 
um, one with a value of more than one, or a three value one, I'm sorry, a three value one like Pittsburgh or Richmond. Speaking of which, let's just put that second one in Richmond because we really got to push back the Union because they're kind of menacing the second capital of the co Confederacy. The first capital was Montgomery, by the way. Okay, and that's it. We're now prepared to move to July of 1862. So I'll go ahead and move the marker to there. And that's that. All right. A House of Divided is an extremely popular game. I think when I looked on Board Game Geek, it had something like almost a thousand comments that people have made about it. Um, it is kind of light. Some people don't like it um, because they don't think it reflects the Civil War accurately. I guess it depends on what you're looking for as far as the game goes. Now, some of the things I did not talk about here, optional roles, advanced roles, there are leaders if you want to do that sort of thing. Um, there's also some other rules about foreign intervention, uh, confederate ironclads. Uh, one of the rules I do use is the coastal ones, because I noticed when I didn't use the coastal ones, um, if the Union rolls a six on their turn, they can do an invasion. And if you look down here on the coast, like Wilmington and Charleston, they have a, a number value there. Um, that's also their um, their value for um, for garrisons from a sea invasion only, uh, coastal defenses basically. And if you don't use that, it's very easy for the Union to get a foothold and then quickly expand. That's why I landed in New Bern when I had that chance, because New Bern doesn't have has have the coastal defenses and stuff. Uh, which, by the way, that did actually happen. The Union did land in coastal North Carolina. Um, grabbing New Bern and also Moorhead City, which I know both of those places quite well um, from vacations. So, so anyway, there's so you have a house divided. Um, it is a nice light Civil War game if you're looking just for one that gives you a good feel strategically. The American Civil War, I think this fits the bill. Quite frankly, like I said, it's going to be my go-to game, and uh, I'm looking forward to um, to using it for that purpose uh, whenever I feel that that. Uh, time come around here and stuff you know because like I said I don't most of my majority of my collection probably two-thirds if not greater maybe even 75 percent of my collection is World War II stuff because um, those of me are just kind of looking around the room and stuff um, at any given shelf I mean yeah most of them you know I have a handful of ancient games I do have almost all the Napoleonic 20 games except for I think Albion I think that's how you pronounce that, the the one for the hypothetical invasion of the UK. I think it's the only Napoleonic 20 I wasn't able to track down. I think I have everybody else. Um, but, you know, from that earlier time period, um, you know, I just don't have a lot because it's just not something that interests me a lot. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm interested in Napoleon. Most people have an interest in Napoleon that enjoy military history. Uh, and Frederick the Great. Frederick has always fascinated me. Uh, I think basically because he fought at such incredible odds and just, you know, just had such drive and such will. But also, you know, he, he really tried to be, I think, a well-rounded individual, too. Um, he's the most interesting character to me. I've read several biographies of Frederick the Great. And, um, yeah, they've been interesting. So, um, But I had already did a video of that uh, Frederick... A Dangerous Time, which is definitely my favorite Frederick the Great game. All right, so there you have a house divided. Give you an idea of the gameplay. See if it's something for you or not. Maybe not. Um, yeah, so now I'm thinking, at this point, my thinking is, is going this way. I am thinking that I'm probably going to do um, Here Come the Rebels as my next one, and I'll probably do... The scenario, I forget which one it is. I think it's number three. It's McClellan's Opportunity, I think it's called, which basically is reflecting the lost orders um, situation, which I'll talk a little bit more at the beginning of that video um, when I get that far. All right, so for those of you who missed me, I'm back in action. Uh, I don't know how frequently. We'll have to wait and see how, how things go here, calming down and everything and stuff like that. But... Um, yeah, I, I, hopefully I didn't flub anything here. I might have. Um, you know, it's always possible, and that's just part of the learning process. And again, help other people to avoid the rule. I'm happy to take the the hit, take the heat, 
be the guinea pig, whatever other phrase you want to use. Okay. One other thing I'll say about this game too is that on Board Game Geek, and I haven't even looked at Constant World, but on Board Game Geek there's tons of support for this game. So if you're interested in it, there is a lot of stuff that you can, you know, dig into and people make player aid cards and rule summaries and, and all kinds of stuff. So, um, yeah. So there's lots of support for this game. If this ends up being your cup of tea. Alright. So, as always, this is Tim Korchmark from Bare Bones Wargaming saying thanks for watching and I'll see you next time and see if, um, I can do a better job of taking advantage of the Lost Order um, than little Mac did. And again, at the, the beginning of that episode, I'll, I'll give you a little background on that. Uh, for those of you who may not, not know uh, about it, it's, it's one of the more interesting episodes in military history. It, it's kind of like... It, it, it's, it's like the wish fulfillment of almost every military commander ever. And what happened is just... <sighs> What's the word? Sad. Sad is definitely the word. So, more about that next time. So, again, thanks for watching. I'll see you next episode.